Good afternoon. It is um, 102. And I'm waiting for the little record signal. There it is. It is 102, and we'll call to order the June 8, 2020 Public Safety Committee meeting. Um, I'd like to, um, if we could, open this meeting with a brief moment of silence, both for the George Floyd family and all those that have been impacted um, from injustice through any means, certainly with a lot of folks in our city hurting. Just a quick moment of silence, please. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, committee members, we are in truly an amazing time for our country and our city. The challenges before us are not new challenges, but they are things that I believe that we are all prepared and ready to stand up and to take on these challenges and the great opportunities that are before us. It's also time to have wise discernment and to listen to wise counsel as we consider these options and that's a lot about what today is about. I have seen every one of us around this council stand and support of these calls for justice. And I know that this is not anything new for, for many of us. Um, today remains about listening. I'm reminded as a mediator by training that you can never come up with the right and create good options without listening and understanding where people are coming from and what's on the table. And so today, um, I'm encouraged by the presentation by um, Chief Hall and John Fortune as it relates to the real change, restore trust and build relationships in policing briefing of item B and, and for item C to give our public safety committee the opportunity to um, make general comments as it relates to what's going on now in our city and for our committee have opportunities to ask questions of, of any available staff, and then to very, very clearly identify the types of policies and the recommendations that each one of us have, as we have been listening for the last um, several days. Um, I'm reminded that each of the protests that I've been to, I've talked to a lot of different people, and the, the consistent message has been, we just want to be heard. And so this is our opportunity, not only to, to hear, but now to start translating some of what we've been hearing into action. And so my hope is by the end of this committee, we'll have a good list of action items, of steps, of things we can do to move this city forward as it relates to public safety and, and so many different areas that are impacted. This committee has been engaged in a number of reforms um, over the last couple of years, we've made great strides in the establishing the Office of Police Oversight and the Citizen Police Review Board. We've created and extended the care. We've opened up and given more access to complaint systems in our police department. And we've eliminated old warrants and unenforceable uh, citations, and created and had our teams trained in implicit bias and created a integrated office of public safety among many, many other things. And I appreciate each one of your efforts in this and I look forward to hearing more about what we can do. For housekeeping purposes, the first briefing, I sent a memo out in the last week, but the first briefing item, the update on the One Dallas plan will allow a lot 30 minutes. So be cognizant of our time. Um, that doesn't mean we're not gonna have a lot more discussion about this in the future, but just wanting to get some explanation and answers and the opportunity to ask a few questions. So uh, time will be of the essence, but you can also reference back to that during your um, essentially 17 minutes during item C for each committee member. Non-committee members that are here, we appreciate that. Once you to engage, uh, we have limited amount of time on that, trying to keep things moving forward as best we can. Um, with that, I will open um, first item A, the approval of the minutes, the March 3rd minutes and May 11th, 2020 minutes. So is there a motion for approval of the minutes? Move to approve both. 
hear a motion. Is there a second? I think I heard a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. The minutes passed unanimously. We will now move to item B. Um, I believe John Fortune is listed as presenting. Thank you, committee members. Actually, I'm going to uh, ask TC. I think he's online. He wanted to make a few opening comments, and then I'll take it up from there. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members, as well as guests on the line. Can you hear me? Can. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say uh, before John got into the depth of the uh, real change, that I appreciate uh, the city council, particularly council member Magoo, for calling this meeting uh, to really hear a little bit more about uh, one Dallas real change and look forward to the ongoing conversation and the additional things that may need to be discussed and reviewed uh, with the council uh, along with the team and the chief and her staff. So again, John, why don't you uh, take over from here and walk the council through the program? Thank you. Thank you, TC. Um, committee members, I just wanted to, uh, to make you aware that the presentation, um, the actual presentation that I'm about to go over is something that we just uh, developed over the weekend and sent to you this morning. But I want to show you, you know, that there's no new information in this presentation from the memo that was presented to you with the packet on Friday evening. I just wanted to provide a tool for us to kind of more easily walk through the, the real change um, program. So with that, let's go right into uh, the slide three, Miriam. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that we all, as we all know, that um, the recent events that have happened in our country are, have really brought international attention to the difficult relationships between law enforcement and communities of color. And as TC indicated, it was per his direction that the city is taking this as an opportunity to proactively address the historical and the present, these present day challenges. And what we're trying to do is align our intentions and resources to build a foundation of trust between these marginalized communities and law enforcement. And listening to and learning from our diverse community, we believe is really the first step to help us move toward uh, uh, a union as one Dallas. So Project Real, one Dallas, real change. This has been launched uh, to provide a scalable action-based plan which is aligned with 21st century policing. In just a few minutes, I'll go through the tenets of 21st century policing and give you an example of some of the things that we've done over the last year, year and a half, but also to provide you some, some foundational context for what we're planning to do and hoping to do as we move forward. But real change, um, first and foremost, aims to establish policing that is responsible. We want to ensure that we're fostering relationships that promote programs and initiatives and that protect and serve all members of our community. Secondly, we wanna make sure it's equitable. We wanna address the racial and anti-bias tendencies to eliminate barriers and focus on inequities and improving everyone's safety. We want it to be accountable, transparent about policing processes and practices to increase community trust. And finally, legitimate. Ensure policies, procedures, and systems and decision-making have legitimacy to build that trust. And so. Those are the major tenants for real and the real change. And I wanted to just set that context um, for the rest of our conversation. So on the next slide, um, what you see here is, is a kind of an overview of what we've done. Um, obviously, building trust and legitimacy, if, if you're not familiar with 21st century policing, it's one of the tenants of that um, program. And it's something that we have through our, um, the department has for some time now been advocating a movement toward. It's been the basis for most of our um, our decisions and plans that we've put in place as it relates to review from the KPMG study to the prime plans that the chief has, has um, provided not only this past year, but in the previous year as well. Um, under this tenant, we see that the department has already, um, as, as Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, as you and the chair has indicated, you know, we've supported the, the establishment and the creation of the Office of Community Police Oversight, as well as the revamp and kind of the restructuring of the Community Police Oversight Board. The, Police Department, through is uh, through its its um, processes and through its its planning, feels like that is exactly where we need to be in order we in order to help build that trust and legitimacy in the community. Um, the chief has also instituted some time ago some ongoing community advisory board meetings. These are a group of, of residents and um, community stakeholders who meet with the chief regularly 
to give her a sounding board for policies and procedures and feedback about things that are happening in the community that is helpful and relevant to help um, the police department respond appropriately. Um, the department has also began sharing officer-involved shooting information with the community. And this is one of those things where I'm not saying we put a pin in this and, and claim victory. I think there's more that we're, we want to do here, and that's going to be part of the discussion here in just a few minutes as it relates to some of the next actionable steps. In terms of policy and oversight, it's and the, the next tenant under 21st century policing, we've uh, initiated officer drug testing after de deadly force incidents. And we've improved and overhauled the accessibility of the officer complaint process. We have reevaluated the um, adjustment and adjusted our practices for hiring officers and the qualifications for officers. And then in the next tenant, you'll see from, as it relates to um, social and technology, um, most of you I know are intimately aware of the Starlight program, the relaunch of the iWatch Dallas app, the increase uh, in use of the body-worn cameras, as well as the implementation of the Dallas online reporting system. These are all things that we've done with the tenant and premise of trying to promote new ways in which we can build the trust and use the technology to advance those principles of 21st century policing. In the next category, we talk about community policing and crime reduction. Um, in this instance, um, I would just point you to some of the uh, summer youth programs that Chief Hall has created, as well as the increase in the number of Unidos, uh, Hispanic and Latino liaisons and engagements that we have implemented just this past year. Um, I'll point you to the implementation of the Right Care team to proactively address behavioral health calls. And again, this is one of those that we know is we've just laid the foundation for. We have much more work to do in this area and we have a plan to do so. Um, we began the implementation of the APMG staffing recommendations. It helps us rethink the way we deploy officers to make more efficient use and better allocation of our existing resources. And then finally, in this category, we talk about, I want to just highlight the addition of a full-time LGBTQ plus liaison, which is supported by the community affairs to, again, provide that outreach for um, the community um, in, in that area. And so, um, finally, I'll just um, point out um, something that um, the chair already in indicated, which is for training and education, the implicit bias training, and then uh, the programs that are in place and that are ongoing, as well as the officer wellness and safety. Um, but there it is, a need, and we know, we recognize the tremendous stress that police officers are under on a daily basis. And we, we want to make sure that we're focusing our time and energy on their health and their wellness by mindfulness training and providing them some peer support. And so those are some programs that we have underway currently in the department. Those are kind of what I would put in the category of what we've done. But um, I know we're all here to kind of talk about what's next. So the city manager sent to you late last week, um, we, we provided you some immediate actionable plans for continuing to build the community trust um, with, our, with our city. And so some of those immediate action steps, what I would consider to be in the zero to 90 day timeframe. Um, on June 3rd, the chief, she's already done this. She changed the roll call training board from banning chokeholds. And that's been in place since 2004. Um, she's now made that a um, general board. And so that, that just going beyond just it being a good training practice, um, to, or a good practice to not train officers in the use of chokeholds, um, we now have a general order prohibiting that as well. Um, on June 4th, uh, as you're aware, um, the police department and chief, she implemented the duty to intervene policy. And then on, by June 12th, by this Friday, we plan to implement a warning before shooting policy. Again, these are two very important elements that come from community recommendations as well as some of the best practices um, um, from national uh, law enforcement policy organizations that um, make these one of these two of eight tenants that, that are very important for building that community trust and legitimacy. On June 30th, um, we will have a monthly reporting mechanism for officer contact for traffic stops and citations. As you know, we, we report that we record that um, annually now, and so what our intentions are is to develop a process, whether it's through the dashboard or some other mechanism, to have for the public to see on a monthly basis that type of um, information. Um, we are um, going to create by June 30th a dash cam or body cam release policies for incidents that are critical in nature, and so. Um, we want to be able to show the public what happened. Um, we want to be able to give them the full 
um, insight as to what that particular issue was, whether it's a shooting, a police shooting, or officer involved shooting, or anything else. The plan is to be able to um, provide a policy that everybody knows in advance so that when we get into these in incidents or these in incidents occur, um, we'll have a plan in place to provide and, and disclose to the community. And then lastly, on this category, in terms of immediate action, um, the chief is going to review all of our use of force policies and kind of evident in front of the first three bullets that you see there and uh, make sure that we're doing everything we can to be consistent with the, the national standards that exist. And we also want to make sure that we get those published on our website for full, full transparency. In the next category, um, what I would consider the short term, the next 90 to 120 days, um, we're going to recommend expanding the right care program to include at least two additional um, behavioral health teams. Um, the idea is to enhance and improve increase the number of clinicians that we would have assigned to these teams so that we can continue to look for ways in which we can divert um, behavioral health calls to avoid um, taking someone to jail for um, behavioral health issues. Um, they're not getting help in the jail. Um, we know that and we need to be able to have a team that's uh, broad enough to cover the whole city to build off the successful programs we've had in the South Central Patrol Division. Um, this would include developing some chronic consumer services for those individuals that um, will need some continuing and ongoing uh, support through their issues, as well as some dedicated training for the entire police department, so that as we're, um, as officers may encounter someone with a behavioral health issue, they'll be better equipped to know how to relate and handle those, those very dangerous and sometimes very difficult situations. On, by November 27th, the chief is going to implement a robust early warning system that will assist the department and supervisors to identify those officers with three or more incidents that could be cause for concern so we can proactively and preemptively address any specific training needs or reinforcement of, of standards, police standards, or expectations with those officers. And we think this is one that's going to be very important for us. It's something I think is as uh, um, Will, will provide an opportunity to really change the mindset for people. If we can get into their situations early enough, we can hopefully prevent any catastrophic situations down the road. And finally, we would talk about the long-term plans. Um, by January of 2021, we would like to um, have implemented a program that's kind of uh, something that would help build and enhance community relationships. Um, the idea is, is to use the concepts of procedural justice to bring police officers and community members together so that they can sit down and, and start building relationships and building that trust and trying to restore that trust between um, the public and the police department. By May 21st, um, we talked about this previously, it was in our uh, prime plan for this year was to start the process of developing a cultural assessment of the department. And this is really going beyond just understanding what people think about the department. This is really about identifying strategies of how we can begin to change the culture of policing and the culture of how we relate to the community. And so um, we believe this is one that has, this is a, an area for significant um, benefit to us and our community if we can get to the bottom of some of these very specific strategies that we want to develop in terms of our culture. And finally, on May 21st of 2021, um, we would like to have completed a comprehensive review of all city, uh, of all DPD uh, general orders in conjunction with a review through the Community Police Oversight Board. And so I know I went fast, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. I know you have some ideas of trying to keep this to a 30 minute uh, window, and I will um, just stop at this point and just be available. I know Chief Hall's available, TC and myself are all available to answer questions. I'm going to turn the rest of this time back to you and the committee members. Thank you, Mr. Fortune. Uh, we can open it up to questions from the committee. Sure. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Thomas. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, DC, John, Chief, for the presentation. I have several questions. Uh, first, I uh, want to acknowledge that uh, Mayor Johnson has signed President Obama's pledge. Uh, he had a town, President Obama had a town hall meeting um, last, uh, I believe it was last Tuesday, and uh, at the town hall, he challenged mayors all across the country to sign the pledge. The, the pledge requires him to review police policy within 60 days and to come back with a report in 90 days. And uh, I hope 
um, those who, you know, chief and other staff members will be available to have that discussion with him regarding some of those policies since he's made that pledge. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, I believe on page seven we talked about um, the liaison of Unidos. Who are the uh, who is the um, liaison to the African American community and engagement? So, um, Council Councilman Thomas, this is Chief Hall. We don't have a specific African American um, liaison. Jolie Robinson is the community engagement um, director, and she is the, the outreach, as is uh, multiple African American sergeants uh, that have different sectors, whether it is uh, the boxing program, whether it is uh, uh, multiple pals, chess, and things like that. So there is no uh, specific liaison for the black community, but our, our leader is an African American uh, female. Well, let me ask you this. When we have events such as uh, uh, what happened with uh, Mr. Floyd, and we need to talk to our black clergy, we need to talk to our black community uh, organizations, our black fraternity, sorority, who is that person who has those conversations? Uh, that those conversations come through me, but there's uh, Joe Lee Robinson is the liaison who reaches out, gets those individuals in the room, and those individuals ultimately sit down with me. They, they serve, uh, have a stakeholder meeting, and they all sit on my stakeholder meeting, and we just had a call on last week, Wednesday. So we have calls every month. We would normally have meetings every month, but due to corona, uh, we've been doing calls, and she's the one who reaches out to all of those individuals. Well, I would suggest, suggest considering uh, appointing someone from the African American community, a point person uh, that um, they can call directly. I know you're pretty accessible, but oftentimes, you know, you can't always be everywhere and be accessible to everybody at the same time. And so I would suggest you uh, give that consideration on uh, page nine. Um, you know, I just got to be honest, because I really don't know any other way to be. You know, we can't do business as usual right now. The protests are not going to stop until we take some immediate action, until we actually, and I'm going to talk about this in the next portion, uh, actually sit across from them and say, hey, what are you asking for? Um, those things that the council can approve, and we know what they're asking for. They're asking for change, not just with police policy, but they're asking change in terms of how we re how we allocate funds. And that's us. That's on us. And so we're going to have to make decisions that people are not going to be very happy with. I just got to be honest about it. Um, page nine, please. We get the presentation back up. Miriam, can you bring the presentation back up on page nine? We're working on it, Councilman Burns. Thank you. Um, the what's next. Let, let, let me stop and acknowledge the, 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 the work that was done, the memo that came out Thursday, the policy changes. You know, I'm talking with um, a number of, uh, I was at a couple of rallies. I'm talking to people that are out protesting and demonstrating, and they acknowledge this is a good start, but it's not going to get us, you know, where we, where we really need to be. Um, at the end of the day, we want to get the protesters out of the street. We want to make sure our issues and concerns are addressed and heard. And we want to be able to make sure that we're implementing so many of these things that are long, 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 long overdue. Um, this timeline, um, I see uh, there's already been uh, one change. There's an attempt to be, there are plans to make additional changes. We'll say the third and the fourth. Okay, so that's two days. Uh, we have potentially, the, we have the 12th as planned, um, the 30th um, monthly reporting. So let me start right there. 
It says, begin monthly reporting the officer contact data on all traffic stops. Where will this information be made available? So we're trying to have it forward facing uh, with our dashboard, our new uh, forward facing dashboard that was just created. If we can put that alongside of the rest of the data in the police department, then it would be right. It would be captured there. Okay. Do we have a date? When, uh, and I know we, we looked at a draft of that new dashboard. Do we have a date when that dashboard will be active? Yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, it should be active um, very, very soon. I'm hoping to have it active this week. If it's not active already, um, it should be this week. Okay. On the next one, creating and implementing the body and dash cam policy to release uh, my pictures here. I can't read all of the incident. Um, what time frame we looking at in terms of this information being released? So when you say which information, what do you mean which information? Creating and implementing the body and dash cam policy to release. Uh, maybe I can move myself out of here. It's where, where our picture is, is right over that center. I'm, June I can't 30th. read. June, June 30th, sir. Right. But how long? And I guess this is a different question. How long are we saying that from the time that we have the, the body cam, the dash cam, in 24, 40 hours, how long oh. before that information be released? I apologize, sir. I didn't understand the question. Yes, no we're problem. looking at uh, uh, 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, um, actually looking at 48 hours because that gives us an opportunity to, to collect the video and actually compile it so that we can get it ready for the public. So 48, some cities have 72 uh, and so we're looking at those those time frames. Forty eight hours is our preference. Okay. Um, what's going to determine that? Because I know you said it's our preference. What's going to determine? You know, will we have a hard and fast time? So, so right now we're talking to legal as well as the DA's office to 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 kind of solidify that and what that actually looks like. So that's going to determine that, and then our opportunity to go out, grab the video, uh, and capture all officers involved and all of the video in order to be able to release uh, accurate information. Okay. Do we currently have, um, you know, whenever, whenever, is it just kind of whenever the, the information is available, we release that, that data? No, what we have right now is within five days, uh, but what happens is within 48 hours, there's a meeting um, with myself and the oversight board monitor, we, and as well as the training staff and uh, command staff and SIU, we review all officer-involved shootings, use of force, and critical incidents, and then uh, make various recommendations and decisions, and then we release that information to the public in a, uh, through our blog in five days. We do keep them updated uh, as the situation unfolds. So when the, the shooting happens, we give them the brief details and then we come back once we have that review and put that information on our blog. Okay. This Chairman, is the Chairman Thomas, uh, last question on round one, please. Okay, thanks. This is a TC question. I'll come back for round two, but I'll be brief. TC. Yes, sir. In preparation uh, for um, pulling out uh, the one Dallas real plan, was there any communication with the uh, uh, Munson Police Oversight Board, the chair of the Police Oversight Board? Uh, no, there wasn't, Councilor. I've committed okay. to working with them on areas uh, specifically within their purview uh, as we move forward. Okay, okay. Mr. Chair, can I have 10 seconds follow up? And I'll be done. 10 seconds. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. TC, regarding that, do you plan to have a conversation with them regarding this and then provide us feedback from them uh, as regarding this particular plan? Uh, yes, I do, Councilman. I've actually spoken with the chair as well as the monitor uh, and ensured them that as we begin to, one, evolve the entirety of uh, real change that they will be involved and included and where, in fact, they've got an opportunity to participate particularly around youth of force uh, and their review uh, of those things juxtaposed to the police chief's uh, 
as well uh, that we'll have that conversation. It's my expectation that they will have a heavy part in our uh, community outreach portion of this as we uh, develop that uh, procedural justice conversation uh, with the entire community. I see them front and center, uh, and in some cases, even hosting and convening many of those meetings. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, other questions? Mendelson. Yes, Councilwoman Mendelson. Thank you. Um, my question is actually aligned with the memo that was um, attached to the um, agenda, not with this PowerPoint that we received today. So um, my first item is actually about um, what you have done. Your Roman numeral one is building trust and legitimacy. And to Councilmember Thomas's point, who has been briefed on this? Who has given input on this? Or is it just universally put out there? And I don't think that actually builds trust and legitimacy. So this evening, Paul, uh, Councilwoman, a lot of the uh, things that you see have come out of meetings with various activists and through- Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop you because you're, you're using qualified words, like a lot of the things you see. But who has, who has looked at this? Who has been briefed on it? Who has given input on what you put out the night before our public meeting? I'm not sure that I understand your question. I, before I supply what has been done in the police department through the work of stakeholders, advisory groups, various activist groups, the things that have been um, asked and have been worked on and done through that work to the city manager's office. So specifically, um, there's a number of items on here that I don't think have ever been briefed. So uh, what's next on immediate warnings before shootings, who's ever been briefed on that? Councilwoman, those general order decisions are made within the police department. Those are under my purview to make. And so they don't require council decision. And so that's just the way it's set up is that um, I have full autonomy to institute general orders within the police department so they don't require uh, council approval. Then I'm gonna go back under section uh, Roman numeral three, also under what's been done under technology, C is body worn cameras. So we're taking credit for body worn cameras. We allocated, I think $900,000 so that everybody um, in uniform would have one as well as SWAT and some of the other um, specialty areas. But then on Friday, you said something that was very surprising to me, which is that nobody on the bridge had a body worn camera activated. And I'm wondering why we spent all this money and why you're taking credit for having body worn cameras when they're not being used. So, so Councilwoman, uh, I would just like to correct you. I didn't say no one on the bridge had body worn cameras. I said all of our officers who were assigned to the protest did not have body worn cameras. And so we had to uh, find out who was on the bridge, who had cameras, and then download that information from the cameras. And let me start by saying that the reason I do take credit because when I came to the police department, we had 900 body worn cameras. It was a relationship and a partnership with myself and Axon uh, sitting down to get uh, up to 2,000 cameras. They gave us the next uh, five or 600 body-worn cameras at no expense moving forward so that because we needed them. And so that was a relationship and a partnership um, that, that in order for us to continue to test uh, and, and make sure that, that this was something that, that worked for us and it had what we needed to put it uh, and, and make sure every officer had an opportunity to have it. And so that is where that partnership came from uh, from uh, my leadership. In and I was going to tell you that I don't think that there's any shortage of support for body worn cameras. I think everybody, as soon as you said you want them, there's no doubt that it would be funded. And if you need more, let us know. Um, well, one minute. The, 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 fine. I'm just going to go through and ask all my questions and not leave time for them to be an answer so at least they can be on the record. For doors, I'm wondering why this has not been implemented across the city. Um, for mental health, uh, we're taking credit for doing right care, but my question is how many right care teams are there and how many calls have they answered? And how many mental health calls have there been 
where we didn't have a care team available. Moving on to um, number five for training and education. Um, I have a lot of questions about how long it will take to get implicit bias training for all of our officers and what that schedule looks like. If there's an end of course exam or if it's a, a pass fail, if it's a certification. For the 360 simulation, um, we have one actual um, unit. And so again, how long does it take to actually train the whole force? How many have been trained? Is there an exam? Is there a certification? Um, for the warning shots, I have to tell you, there was a Supreme Court case just within the last two years. This is something that's allowed and I think it needs to be looked at. Um, item four under what's immediate, how we haven't in the last three years looked at our use of force policies, I don't understand. Um, long term, I think there's a number of items. Do remember that you have uh, quite a bit of time on the next item, but you can also reference back some of these questions then during that time as well. That's fine, thank you. Uh, other questions from committee members on this item? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, Chief, uh, is, is, is Tanya on the call, the, uh, our monitor? Let me confirm. Definitely should be. She is not on yet, council member, if you could come back to her. Okay, I'll come back to her. Um, uh, John Fortune, I wanted to ask, um, I guess, Ordinance wise, you, you know, I think one of the, the concerns that I've had and expressed with outside agencies is not that uh, I don't I don't um, appreciate the help, but we are not able to um, hold them accountable um, with our, our oversight board or oversight policy. Um, from my understanding, um, and that's why I was hoping Tanya would be able to clear that up, that uh, is something that we could have changed um, through the ordinance of the oversight board to include um, anyone who is enforcing law uh, within our city. Is that accurate? Councilmember, I, I would have to defer to someone in the legal department to give us some legal aspect or legal um, interpretation of that. Um, I do know that um, each agency who um, is involved in enforcing um, has their own um, disciplinary process that's independent of each other. I think what you're referring to is having some rules of engagement and for joint operations, um, whether it's a uh, protest enforcement or any other type of joint activity that yeah, would exactly. put everybody on the same same rules. And so um, I'm not in a position to be able to answer that question. I don't know what legal authority we would have to discipline an officer for another agency. Um, that doesn't mean we may not be able to look at the case and maybe that's what Ms. McClary is referring to um, based on the cooperation with that other agency, but I don't know that we could provide any disciplinary um, actions against any of the officers. Okay, then with that said, if any of these ordinance or ordinances are put in place, um, including um, an implementation of mandatory body cams, if we are relying on our emergency response with outside agencies that we don't have the ability to um, discipline or oversee um, in a formal fashion. Why, why, why does that make sense? Um, Councilor, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. I'm just saying to you, there's not a mechanism that I'm aware of that allows for us to discipline and, and evaluate the actions of another officer from a disciplinary standpoint. Obviously, is there a way for us to, uh, to, to uh, require them if they are going to be on our streets to uh, adhere to, I mean, if they are gonna be on our streets, they have to have a body cam um, and dash cam just as our officers do? Most agencies that have operate, um, let's take um, some state agency that's here, they have state jurisdiction to operate here whether we ask them to be here or not. It's about the level of coordination that we have. And so, again, I'm not sure 
what the city of Dallas can do to mandate a policy for another law enforcement agency that has a legal basis for operating within our jurisdiction, whether that's DISD, DART, police, or any other police agency. I'm not saying they can't, I'm not answer that question. So that's something we would so, have to so, pursue. I'm sorry, Mr. Yes, Chief. Paul, we can look at our mutual aid, because we have mutual aid agreements, and we can look at that to see if that's an option. Thank you, Chief. Um, I also wanted to ask um, about the uh, the need for us to have um, response. Um, well, I guess I can actually save that question for the next meeting. Um, I, I, I appreciate the uh, proactive measures being taken by um, TC and, and uh, Chief Hall. I know that this is uh, just just the beginning of changes uh, to come. Uh, I think it was things that could be done um, that didn't require council action, and um, it provided a lot of, um, uh, I guess it eased a lot of the concerns and, and uh, feedback that we're getting from the community, and I would love to, uh, to continue on um, the discussion. Um, now, I believe, um, going past just policy changing uh, changes, but also um, discussing uh, on, on moving forward uh, some different budgetary options that uh, I've spoken with different council members about and uh, TC as well. Thank you, um, Mr. That I, Can you wrap this up, please? Yeah, I, I want to say that, that, you know, to, to be clear, um, when you say defunding, it doesn't mean to take uh, it doesn't have to mean to take officers away. This isn't uh, have to be necessary about uh, personnel, but I think that there's going to be some um, a need for some really productive conversations with all stakeholders, and uh, hopefully Chief Hall um, is going to be willing to to um, to talk about what those changes will look like and what uh, is going to be the most effective ways for us to um, kind of reimagine public safety. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other committee members. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. That is Council Member Blewett. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Friday night, I talked a little bit about the evolution of the protests, and I also talked a little bit about the evolution of the police responses. And, and I like uh, where this all went. But Chief Hall, I think I asked you Friday, and I'm not sure if I got a definitive answer on an after action. I didn't want to report from the evening, but I did want to know, when are we going to have more of a report for like the last 10 days that kind of shows that evolution that we discussed. Is there a timeline? I don't know if you, if you answered that. No, sir, I didn't give you a timeline at this time. What, we, uh, what I did state is that an after action usually is, is done after the entirety of the situation. This right. was an ongoing, like we're still doing protests even up to today. And so uh, our resources to pull together all of the information and put it together and dissect it and go through it and give you an accurate report is done after the incident is actually clear and we're done with it. And so that allows us to do that. So we're looking outward to see when are we done with protests um, so that we can move forward to an after action plan. And right now I don't have a timeline. We have protests scheduled through Tuesday um, that we know of. And so uh, we are we are so thankful to our community for the peaceful protests. There's been thousands of individuals out in the street, um, and it's been very peaceful. And, and so we're thankful for that, and we're you know, ready to get to the work that needs to be done sitting at the table. And so that's, what, uh, that's where our end point is, is when the protests actually end, because most of our resources that are dedicated to actually pulling this information, putting it together, and getting and dissecting it is as a sign to this protest. And yeah, so, Chief, I, I'll kind of, it's hard for anybody to put a timeline on when the protests are gonna end or what the end result's gonna be. And I'm not sure that, that we can really wait for an undefined time to have more knowledge of this evolution that I keep talking about. If I could ask maybe, maybe we could put a basis to kind of show more than just an evening of because um, I have seen a difference from the protesters and I've seen a difference from the police response. And I think that's an important narrative. And I don't think we can wait for the, all the activity to be over. We, we don't know when that would be a week, a month. We don't know what could happen. So 
I would like to see that change. And I'd like to send a message to the public that we've listened to them, that we are making changes and they need to know that. And so I, I would like to have something a little quicker than just the end of all the activity. Um, so if you chew on that and get back to us, let me, let me know or let all of us know what, what you think about that. I'd really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, to go to on the screen that's up right now, page nine, where you talk about monthly reporting of officer contact. I and mean, that's something that goes hand in hand with an after action report, which is the idea of transparency and telling the public what's really going on. What, what in more, do we know what that reporting is going to look like? Is it a dashboard? Is it, gonna, what's a memo? What, what is that going to look like? So, so we're trying to have it forward facing like our, uh, crime report and, and data that's uh, coming out, this, uh, Mr. Fortune said it should be done this week. So having that forward facing so they can see uh, the demographics, uh, where we're stopping, who we're stopping, and what we're stopping those individuals for and, and that we're coming in contact. So a, a forward facing uh, dashboard with, in, with the information attached. So the dashboard. Um, because this goes hand in hand with, like I said, the after action reporting, giving information to our, our residents, our citizens, the people who are on the streets. I've, I've personally seen a lot of misinformation. And so I think the more accurate information we get out there, the better, good or bad. And I'm very supportive of transparently getting that data out there. I hope it's a very intuitive, easy to access, comprehensive dashboard that people can see what's really going on. I think that's a great step to tell people that we're listening and um, what we're doing. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Medrano. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Chief and John, I guess everybody, um, where are we with, um, I know that several of us mentioned trying to get the um, charges dropped for the Sunday curfew. Uh, I know that there were several journalists and photographers that were, um, I don't know if they were given a ticket or arrested or whatever happened to them. Uh, where are we with trying to get those dropped just like we did with um, the folks on the bridge? So so those went right over from uh, the night that they were detained and I've reached out to the DA. I'm awaiting his a response from him. So that's a conversation that, that uh, I'm waiting on with him. He has to get all of them and and then move forward, but I have reached out to him in that process. Okay, uh, I think other council members asked some of the questions I was gonna ask, so that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, other questions from committee members? Uh, I'm, I do have a comment, Chair. Yes, Chairman Arnold. All right, thank you so very much. I, I, I appreciate so much the energy, and I do wanna, I, I'm just a couple of things because I want us to move forward. On Mr. Uh, council Member Blewett's note, uh, in terms of getting information back. And I can just only speak as a professional and it perhaps would help. But I think as we move forward in this whole endeavor, as we tailor our meetings and require staff to come, we, I think we need to be a little bit more supportive because if we're looking for reports and, and factual and up-to-date information, it's gonna help us to help them get the time that they need to work with staff. We have to understand we're pulling staff uh, among a number of committees and we're pulling in the police department and, and, and I'm not making any excuses. We're just talking real, real deal. So I think we need to be mindful of how we're pulling them away from what we really want them to do in terms of reporting. Uh, and, and as she said, we're continuing every day with protests. That is what it is. But I think some of it, if you give us a, them a chance to pull together some data, uh, particularly I can cite, uh, we're talking about the bridge, um, uh, Sunday night, whatever, we do have to be mindful, as, as, as she just stated, if it's going to DA, <clears throat> there's a process. And you have to understand some folks uh, have warrants and some they, they got some issues. So everybody's not squeaky clean. And so they may have been looking for somebody that just happened to show up. Showing up. So we have to give, the I think, the, the system an opportunity to work. And that's my position. Uh, also, as we talk about this particular uh, real plan, I did want to share, particularly Ms. Carol Mendelson's uh, comments, because I'm getting a number of, of texts. I need to go on the record very clearly that uh, we are working, I know in District 4 with uh, South Central uh, in, in particular, and we have relationships. We are going to continue to build relationships. We've got to, everybody is not trusting everybody that has on blue. We know that, but I can tell you 
we are working on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it kind of, it upsets some of our members who are listening that we, we, we have this statement as if there's no, no relationship building in the process. I, I'm gonna speak for my district. So I did wanna mention that, but I also want to say, as we talk about restoring trust and building relationships, what my community is saying on a regular basis, and you can go out to Zoo Creek and talk about the drug houses that they've had to deal with, go on Kellogg Street and they're dealing with murders and drugs and prostitutes up in 10th Street in the historic district, walking the streets. Let's go down here off of Ledbetter, <coughs> excuse me, Illinois, where the uh, owner of the funeral home has to run the prostitutes off who having sex, open sex in daytime right outside the funeral home. Uh, we got murders, on Bonneview, shootings, domestic violence, men beating women, uh, men who also beating children and endangering their lives. So we got quite a bit. And so we need a relationship. And that's part of what I deal with. As in, and I have to be accountable to those individuals. So I did want to mention that and also caution everyone who's listening, because I know everyone is being torn from different directions. My primary responsibility is the district for primarily. And so I have to be careful when we get caught up, you have a number of outsiders who've been brought in for the main purpose of, 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 of making waves. And as I look even at some of the emails that I have, I have people talking to me about what we need to do in Dallas and they're from Frisco and there are other places. So I'm focused on Dallas, District 4 in particular. And that's where I'm, 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 I was elected to do that in District 4. And I'm gonna do the best I can to address those concerns that speak specifically to the day-to-day -day building of relationships and the concerns that we may have with this, with the blue. And, and I'm gonna tell you, it's not perfect, but I'm willing to work it until we get where we need to be. So I did wanna put that on the record as we move forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there other questions from committee members? I just have one more for this presentation. I, I couldn't hear who. Is that Basil? I just have one more question for this presentation, Mr. Chair. Yes, please briefly. Yes, um, I, I was just curious if you, um, Chief Hall, if you have um, some recommendations that you can provide as well. I'm sure you collaborated with TC, but I know that TC put out this memo um, with things that that could be implemented immediately. I, I just would like to uh, to see if um, you could provide the committee with some recommendations straight from you um, on what you believe could also be added to this. So real quick, Councilman, before I let the chief answer, I just wanna be clear. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So, uh, and chief will probably say it, but all of these recommendations came from the chief. And my challenge to her as we were thinking through this was tell me what it is that we need to be doing as a police department that is under and directly that you might be able to go and do immediately uh, that needs to be done, should have been done long before you arrived here. And she went and worked with her team as well as John Fortune and they came back uh, with these items. Uh, the only influence and conversation I have and really am more concerned with for me, at least my interactions has been how that community engagement process uh, and the layers of it are as it relates to this conversation with the community. And so I'll have probably uh, some framing and work with them on that because I'm experienced in doing that, what I believe is a right and effective way. But these recommendations are from the chief and she probably has okay. several more. I just want to share that. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Um, I, the rest are Jermaine to the next. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just have one. Uh, it's on page nine, so you can keep it up. Um, I know we'll be on recess. This is our last meeting before uh, we go on recess, and we won't be back until August. So my question is, um, Chief um, TC, looking at the review, all use of force policies, is there possible to speed that timeline up from August 28th? potentially to maybe the middle of August after we get back? So this is Chief Hall. Um, uh -huh. We wanted to give ourselves time to go through with our uh, oversight board as well. And I just want to put it on the record 
And we're not just looking at our use of force policies. Uh, upon me coming to this police department, each chief was charged with looking at policies in their respective areas. And here we looked at use of force policies. And if you look at the president's eight for eight, uh, we were seven of the eight uh, before this incident even happened. So we've been looking at our policies. Now we're going through to see if our policies that were placed in, 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 uh, in put in place are in line with still what our community is asking for. So that is what the re this review, not initial view, but another review alongside of our uh, oversight board, uh, because we put them in place based on law enforcement. So now we're looking at the community to make sure uh, that what we have in Dallas's uh, use of force policies is uh, commensurate with what our community is actually looking for as well. So um, we're asking for that time so we can make sure uh, that uh, each person gets an opportunity to actually look at it and we can look at it collectively and make the necessary adjustments. If you, if we're just asking for that grace. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, with not hearing any other questions, we'll go ahead and go to Mendelson. item C. Mendelson, yes. So I guess my last comment is just this, that I'm concerned that our role on city council and specifically in this committee is about policy and oversight. And I really feel like a lot of this should have come before us before it was released. And while I appreciate that you have um, heard from people and from groups um, independently of that, they were not elected by the city, by the residents of the city to give that input. They were selected by you or whomever else. And um, that's actually our role. And so I just don't think that this should have been released. We're not even done with the protests. We haven't even looked at the data. You're telling us on Friday you haven't even looked at that all of the all of the um, the information that's been available to you, and we need to do this in a very thoughtful way. These kinds of changes have big consequences, and we need to make sure our people are safe, and that we make the changes that are smart so that we're building the kind of community we all want to live in. So those are my concerns. Um, And that's all I'm going to say on that. Thank you. So thank you, Councilmember Mendelson. I'll also add to um, Chairman Thomas's point as well. Um, yes, recess is coming up, but I, I would, depending upon how the rest of this briefing goes and certainly the other issues, I could see us potentially having a special meeting before uh, the end of the month to continue to address some of these items. So um, I'll certainly take feedback from the committee on that issue as well. Um, with that, we will go to item C. Um, for purposes again of, of housekeeping, this is this is up to you, committee members, on how we um, lead this part of the process. I want to give everybody an opportunity for an opening statement. They have opportunities to ask questions of any staff. You can follow up on the line of question you had before, and then a closing if you like. So for a total of 17 minutes, we'll be tracking the clock, and I'll give you uh, time heads up as we go through that. Um, but with that, we will open this up for your discussion and or questions specifically regarding the, the what Councilmember Mendelson was just talking about, question, oversight of police and partner agencies response to protests in the city of Dallas and the recommendations for specific policy reviews and changes moving forward. Um, if, if you're ready, Councilmember Arnold, we could start with Vice Chair Arnold. Thank you. Uh, this is what I need for the record before I start, Chair. Well, I need to understand if you could just give me the names of these partner agencies response so that I know I'm taking some notes. I need to know who's telling, who's giving this input. That's uh, according to what's posted. It says the P public committee specialist questions and oversight of police and partner agencies response to protest. So who are you, who are you speaking to? Is it about partner agency? So it's, it's, Based on the discussion from Friday, there were several other agencies mentioned, both the DPS as well as the um, 
Texas National Guard and other entities, the county and folks we partner with. If you had questions for those folks, we were gonna open that up and try to get the right people here to answer. I didn't receive personally any questions from committee members on those um, items, but if they are available, we'll certainly want you to have those questions or at least get your questions on the record if that's what you need. Well, I just need to be a clarification of who the partner agencies are, because once again, I want us to be very clear and intentional as we uh, collect information, who is putting information before us and holding, trying to hold our feet to the fire and who's trying to, imp who's trying to Im uh, impact or influence our policy? Whose ear do we have? And, and I just want to make sure that they are here in Dallas or that, that, that they have been sanctioned on a national level or what level that is authentic if we're going to talk about policy. And, and the constituents are, number one, but they are not identified here. It says partner agencies. And that's what I want to make sure of, because as I move forward, particularly with our 365 safe and district four, I want to make sure if there's some other agencies out there we can partner with, I'll do that. So thank you. So if you don't have anything else, I, I'm, I'm ready to move on to the next person. I'll come back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next on the agenda, or who's next committee member? I'll go, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, Chairman Thomas. This is a moment like no other since the 1960s. We have people using the slogan, Black Lives Matter, who would have been ashamed to say it a year ago. The outrage to the murder of George Floyd has been justified. Now we must make changes to police policy that are long overdue. This moment requires us to be bold, and to be courageous. We must meet the demands of the protesters head on. We must sit down at the table and hear their specific concerns. We must act on their demands. We must meet the challenge and put our money where our mouth is when we say Black Lives Matter. We must look at non-traditional strategies for policing, such as utilizing trained medical and mental health professionals to respond to mental mental health calls, and many other strategies that we have not used before in the city of Dallas. It requires that type of moment. Question. Um, John. Yes, sir. I um, believe I sent you, uh, I know I sent you a audio and I don't know if I sent you a document as well. If not, I meant to send you a draft of the document. Are you familiar with other cities' strategies? And I know defund, DPD, defund the police, you know, these are good talking points, whatever the case may be. But are you familiar with some of these strategies that are being suggested um, by many other cities and other um, organizations that are focused on uh, and have a history, you know, Black Lives Matter, other organizations that have been focused on anti-police brutality and reform, police reform strategies. Sir, I appreciate you sending me the article over the weekend. And you did not send me a separate document. You sent me the article. And, you know, I've been looking at um, what other cities have been doing for the last few days. I've been, it's kind of uh, been on a lot of news coverage about it. Um, but to be beyond what I've seen or heard in the news about the debate and the discussion as it relates to what um, varying it can, groups mean by defund or that disinvest, um, we have not done an in-depth study or an analysis as to what specific programs or policies were changed in other cities. That is something that we will be doing as we move forward, just to kind of pour more uh, background and just understanding and awareness. But at this point, I don't have an in-depth knowledge about specific programs or changes in other cities. Were you familiar with the concept of uh, reimagining public safety as something that you heard of in the past? And if so, uh, some examples that uh, have been given when we talk about reimagining public safety. Yes, um, Councilmember, I have heard of the term before. And, you know, those are, those are the, the type of things that we keep in mind when we develop programs like Right Care. When we look at um, 
a better way and more effective way to deal with behavioral health calls. Um, those are also the basis and premise for a lot of discussions that Deputy Mayor Pro Tem mentioned in one of our programs this last year that was supported by the Public Safety Committee, which was to go and address um, old warrants and outstanding warrants that are very aged and don't have any purpose other than to provide another barrier to somebody to get out of their circumstances. And so um, we've had those discussions and we're looking forward to additional ideas and concepts of how we reimagine how we provide law enforcement. That's been the basis and premise for a majority of the KPMG recommendations in terms of just how we interact with people and, and, and respond to priority calls and shift our, our priorities to those crisis calls as opposed to spending times and resources on um, um, you know, lower priority type calls. And those are the, you know, the impetus behind doors and some of the other programs that we've developed. Is it possible that where well, with right care, we do have, you know, officers who uh, actually go out along with medical personnel? Is there a possibility where we can have medical personnel, trained medical or mental health personnel who will go out and respond uh, initially? And if we need backup from uh, Dallas police, that we can look at doing that? Sir, I think everything is on the table in that regard. Obviously, our primary interest is safety for people, and we want to make sure that the situation is safe. The program that we put in place and the one that we hope to expand includes a triage-type component in the community dispatch center, uh, the police dispatch center, so that there's actually a clinician in the center who can help assess what the appropriate response would be for that particular call. So I do think that um, having more social workers, more clinicians involved in those responses is very important. Um, will I, do I personally see a situation where we can remove police officers entirely from every situation? I think that's very hard to know based on the policies we have right now um, and what we see in terms of need. Sometimes it does require a police officer because it's a dangerous situation. What type of intervention, community intervention, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, programs where um, we have neighborhood leaders who go through uh, training and they can basically be eyes and ears for, for, for the police department in neighborhoods. I think, you know, one, as a result of what's happened the past week, we want to reestablish trust. We just are, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think this is going to move into a Chief Hall type of question. The listening session was a great idea. But I, I think a lot of damage has been uh, done to undo a lot of, of that work. Uh, Chief Hall, what what do we can what is it we can do? What is it you can do? What is it that can be done to reestablish and, and and build on some of the trust that may have been initially uh, may have been built initially with the listening session? I think that we go back to the table. I've actually had multiple conversations with some of the individuals participating in the protest um, to have those courageous conversations to bring people back to the table um, and let them know that the listening ear and the response that they've had since the day uh, we walked in and, 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 and committed to these changes are still there and that we are willing to, to, to hear uh, and, and move forward to make the necessary changes in the so I think that's the start. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman Thomas. Other committee members? Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I just want to say that I am, am very inspired by the momentum um, that the movement has um, created. I, six years ago, went to my first Black Lives Matter um, protest after Mike Brown, and uh, it was it was something that I, I will never forget, being one of the only non-Black people there uh, protesting. And to see what where we are now, six years later, um, and the support for the movement and the acknowledgement um, and willingness to listen and understand is something that um, I honestly wasn't sure I would ever see in my lifetime. So I think that it's, um, it's, it's really incredible to have the opportunity to serve 
um, at a time like this. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful to see that uh, we're going to capitalize on um, that understanding and momentum um, that exists. The uh, one of the things that I would like to explore, I have spoken uh, with TC about this uh, in the past on a very uh, 30,000 foot level is the multiple agencies that we have um, on our streets, um, including a um, the student resource officers for the DISD police department. Um, the, uh, I guess, agreement that we have uh, with DART and see if there is an opportunity for to um, streamline that. The reason that I say that is that I have been looking in different cities models. One of the um, turning points in crime reduction in New York City post 9-11 was um, the the um, collection of the agencies that were put in silos and what we have uh, now. Um, I think that that would help as this reform and policy is implemented um, for us to be able to uh, see consistency. I also believe that um, if there was a division um, for student resource officers instead of a, its, its own entity, um, that's another way that we could explore um, starting with the younger generation on establishing trust and that community policing um, goal that I think we all would like to see. Um, that is specific uh, to just some, some uh, overall, um, but I do believe that we have a lot to consider with um, protests. Um, I have some recommendations that I wanted to just get on the record um, <clears throat> and then I guess hear uh, from either TC or um, Chief Hall. But instead of going one by one and getting the questions, I'm just going to go ahead and, and lay them out. Um, I believe that we should um, act quickly in creating policy on response um, to our peaceful protesters to include um, policy to protect the press. Uh, I think that we need to be very clear and articulate how DPD will protect members of the press during protests and ensure um, the protection of exercising the First Amendment's uh, right. Articulate how DPD is going to protect the press um, and essential workers also during city curfews, as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned earlier. Um, we not only had members of the press here uh, that were um, approached uh, to be to have the curfew enforced, but also um, were shot with uh, non-lethal weapons and were part of the tear gas uh, deployment, uh, deployment. And uh, I think that that's pretty unacceptable. And we should have it very clear, um, clearly lined out on how DPD is going to uh, know. Um, and how our city is going to move forward on, on uh, allowing for the press to be protected. Um, I think that I would like to see us uh, prohibit the use of covert surveillance um, as long as there is uh, peaceful, uh, as long as pro protests are peaceful, the use of helicopters, license plate tracking, cell phones, I mean, cell phone surveillances, et cetera. Um, I think that there is some. Um, um, invasive strategies that are used, and I don't believe that we should be going those routes until um, these protests have crossed a line to not be peaceful. Um, I think that that I know that we can't control um, necessarily, uh, or y'all are going to get back to me on the legalities of what um, purview we have on controlling um, other outside agencies, but I believe that something we could easily implement um, immediately would be uh, on the police identification transparency piece and require that name badges and identification be visible on all DBD officers, no matter what uh, gear. Um, and that includes partner agencies that will be out there, um, not to, not only to exclude those we've mentioned, but also dark police as well. Um, 
committed to publicly identifying partner agencies involved in responding to ballot protests, uh, require active body cams for all, we've already gone through that, uh, make record of all police um, accused of using excessive force. If there has been um, a lot of talks in the past several years about some type of registry. I know that's going to uh, require for the most effective measures to, for it to be done um, with other municipalities and uh, hopefully statewide implementation. Um, but for now, we can definitely start um, a database and um, a, a platform for the public to be able to uh, go to um, see if there is a concern um, or if there are evidence with officers that they are uh, possibly experiencing some with themselves. Uh, make records. No, uh, reject any new hire into DPD who has a record of complaints from other force, forces and agencies. Um, I've, I've heard from many people, including um, Tanya, um, about um, that is not enforced and how it's a much larger thing, like I said, than just our city. And if we have some bad apples uh, who leave a, an agency, they um, are, don't have a whole lot of stop gaps to, for them to go to another jurisdiction and get a job. Um, I'd like to see us um, invest in de-escalation training to be done on a more frequent basis. I think that, um, I believe what was said was six hours every two years, um, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I, I think that's a little bit uh, crazy. So in addition to implicit bias um, tra training, I believe the de-escalation tactic training should be um, done much more frequently to, um, to get with anything that has changed. Um, I'd like to... Um, acknowledge the fact that we have a very contentious uh, president in office right now, and we have a presidential election coming up in November. And um, I will, I think it's safe to say that we're probably going to see protests, uh, um, maybe not necessarily all the way through then, but they will be there um, when he's, when, when it's election time, especially depending on what that is. I want to make sure that we have um, a comprehensive plan on providing and ensuring safe elections and prepare DPD officers on how to respond to peaceful demonstrations, specifically at election sites, to not infringe on um, protesters' rights to not only protest, but to vote. Ensure that DPD will not enforce in uh, any then or existing government curfews against Dallas sites during a uh, time that uh, polls are open. And um, I would like to see us implement some aggressive policy that's going to address uh, going forward with protests. I'd like to see us prohibit the use of force um, during protests, rubber bullets, billy clubs, flash bombs, um, tear gas, except in most extreme circumstances. Uh, when I say most extreme circumstances, those would be what would be considered, um, I guess, a threat. Um, I want to just preface that when I say that uh, I don't want these used, it's because we've seen that they've been used inappropriately. And they've been used inappropriately because they've been given as a means and at their fingertips and law enforcement officers have not been properly trained on what those times look like. In addition to these military style weapons um, are not what our tax dollars should be uh, spent on. If uh, in my short time in office over the past year, we have seen three emergency declarations be declared in this state, and we have seen that there is mutual aid that is provided and outside law enforcement agencies that are sent to our city, all of which are equipped with the military grade equipment that, um, that I am speaking of. So even in those ex uh, extreme, extreme circumstances, um, that should not be, that should not fall on the municipality's job. I think it's a waste of our tax dollars, and I don't think that it is uh, um, necessary uh, to be used as a first means in response. Um, I would like for us to look at what uh, 
arresting peaceful protesters are. Of course, that would be with the, uh, the training and come up with some sort of policy around um, arresting of peaceful protesters, um, specifically to address a situation like occurred on the bridge. Um, you know, I, I participated in a march yesterday through South Dallas, and we have hundreds of people. And I, you know, I, I talked with my wife and said, if, if, if I had made a turn down Park Row or South Boulevard, and I wasn't supposed to go down there, it, would the people a quarter of a mile behind me know? No. The, the answer is no. So we need to have much more of um, an open mind and understanding to what these demonstrations are and prohibit the arrest of peaceful protesters who are just exercising their right. We need to prohibit the use of partner agencies, including DART, um, unless in, uh, extreme circumstances have arisen. Um, if we do not have the ability to um, punish or provide consequences to these agencies, then we need to do everything that we can to keep them off of our streets unless we figure out a way that we can hold them accountable. Uh, we need to eliminate the use of all of the military equipment and weaponry uh, as a response, again, until extreme circumstances. Eliminate the use of certain military equipment and weaponry altogether in DPD, including a vote that, yes, hindsight is 2020. Uh, I believe that it was uh, something that I, I ended up voting on to support only because of the justification being that the funding source came from some federal grant dollars and it wasn't out of our general budget. Um, but beyond us spending the money on it, uh, I think that we need to really evaluate what need um, these types of equipment, such as tanks, uh, like two of them that were voted on unanimously by this council and approved uh, not too long ago. Why? We have a need for them to be at our fingertips at all times for a municipal uh, police force that's meant to serve and protect. Um, with that, I will turn it over and, and uh, allow the rest of my time for a response from TC and uh, or Chief Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman, uh, oh, go ahead, Chief. I, I was gonna say you unpacked a, a lot on us <laughs> and so I don't have a response at this time other than that everything that you've given us, we are, we're taking and we're going to review and sit down and, and go through it item by item and, and come back to you. Uh, you and I have monthly meetings and so uh, we'll be able to talk through that and then come back and bring this back to the public safety and or the full council once we are able to look at each one of these items, vet them and see what uh, what we're able to do in these, and what what our what our ability to do in each one of these categories is, and I think that would be fair for, for us to come back to you. Thank you very much, Chief. TC, did you have something you wanted to add? Those were going to be my uh, same words as that you did uh, say quite a bit, uh, and some of those things in some cases, particularly are related to other organizations uh, will have to go and either have some conversation or better understand, but the chief summed it up. We'll get back to you uh, based on their review and then share with the committee as well as yourself as we move forward. Thank you. Great suggestion. Thank, thank you very much. And I, um, whenever you do give me some more guidance, I guess, from the legal perspective of the outside agencies, I would like to know that if there isn't anything that we can do, um, some suggestions on uh, from chief on how our uh, deployment command can um, utilize them uh, because I do believe that we still have the, uh, the say on how they are deployed or at least we did in, in the summer. So I know that the mutual agreements are all, they all vary, but I would like to see that if that is the case uh, that they were brought um, without us asking them, if that was the case that we are able to utilize them in the right way and not have them on our front lines, but yet um, put, our officers who hopefully will have these added trainings and um, support for these situations to be those who uh, respond literally from the front line. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you both for your response. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, who's next? I'm so oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, just quickly. I, I, I want to just be very brief because we're going to follow up in weeks to come and thank once again the 
uh, tag team of, of, of Mr. Brock Nax and Chief Hall and Mr. Fortune and all the staff members. We want to continue to thank them for their uh, commitment to, to being able to respond to us as we request as council. But I want to make sure, since we're talking real and some of it I will, um, I'm going to hold my comments, but I know for sure we've got to be very pointed and intentional as we move forward in bringing people to the table to affect, uh, to frame policy that affect us in the city of Dallas as we move forward for quality of life and, and closing that gap between these divisions in our city uh, and the relationships that we're trying to, we don't want to keep witnessing wedges in some communities and uh, with the public safety partners, because we know we have to have a city of with public safety structure. I mean, otherwise you'd have anarchy and there's no uh, civil, civil, civilized nation can exist without public safety. And that's part of the social, what we call social contract theory. The people gave up some of their rights to uh, governing bodies such as ourselves so that we could make decisions as a whole because man alone, all these different communities could never come together on just how their individual uh, plans would work. So that's why you have to have public safety. You must have a concerted effort with, with public safety. But let me tell you what continues to keep me up at night. You know, I know the struggle and I know, uh, you know, I've, it's been painful over the years to see the abuse to African-American men in particular and African-Americans and, you know, some of the more egregious acts. So I don't, I really don't need to be schooled on that. It's painful. You know, I, I'm still, you know, every day I'm looking at visions, but my point here is this, as we move forward, be mindful of who we are allowing to sit at the table. It's good to have all these voices, true enough. We, we all know here we are, are, have allowed some of these folks to come to this table to tell us what to do with our policies and they have criminal records that they haven't uh, uh, dealt with. And so, and they have behaviors that continue to perpetuate poison here in the city of Dallas as they uh, pretend to be about uh, freedom of speech and fairness. So we've got to call it what it is. You know, we have people here that are be uh, one person in particular with the record and they're trying to tell us what to do with policy. But if you too have abused, uh, have participated in domestic violence, and acts that are criminal, we shouldn't allow them to be at the table telling us what to do uh, with, with, with police officers. It doesn't make sense. So let's call it what it is. Let's be intentional. Let's be pointed. And let's be about taking care of public safety here in the city of Dallas. And yes, it's not going to be very tasteful, uh, some of it, but we have to do what is civil. We have to be humane and we have to be realistic. And so I am concerned too, as we talk about uh, uh, the weapons that we use and whatever. And it bothers me, of course, that we're in Texas. And so you have a governor who supports Second Amendment, when, and, and you have to also understand some of these folks on the street have better equipment than some of our police officers. So we have to, we have to be mindful of what we're saying, and I don't mind being helped. Uh, I don't know everything, but I can tell you I'm willing to do what I have to do to protect the people in this city, be responsive to District 4, and be realistic about where we're going as a city and how we treat each other in this city as we fight for quality of life. So I just want to put that on the record and thank all the council members for doing what they do to help us. But let's be real when we have a conversation and have folks who have a real concern about quality of life in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Arnold. Um, I I'm going to have to step away just for a minute, but I would like to have a couple uh, moments at this moment. If, um, Chief Hall, could I just ask a couple questions of you? Are you, um, when will yes, we sir. get um, a sort of a formal after action report broken down of the, the actions that have taken place over the last few days with all the protests? When, what, what will that look like and when will we get that? Okay, um, council member, uh, chairman, just uh, as I said before, um, usually what happens is we get, we get through the actual incident itself, which here is multiple days. And after that, we have to allow ourselves to get all of that information and then present it to you. So usually anywhere from two weeks to three days um, after. But what we will do 
is, is what we're doing right now is we're collecting as much information as we can as we go through this. And we will try to get you a brief overview. But uh, what our concern is, is documenting information that is not accurate. And so it's we, we, the balance is, do you want it timely or do you want it accurate? Because information changes based on other video and or information that comes in. And so we don't want to put something out there and declare one thing and then just a week later to get another video that um, dispels anything that we put out in the beginning. And that is why it's important for us to gather all of the information before we can give you any fin finite uh, information regarding all of the circumstances, because there's so much information coming in from multiple locations, and to give and to give you information that is inaccurate would, would do the not only the department an injustice, but the community as a whole. It would look as if we're being disingenuous, and that is what we're trying not to do. Thank, thank you, Chief, and I, I understand that. I would say that the circumstances here are. are somewhat different and at least my request would be that we treat um, each day as a separate incident at least that has occurred so far and try to work to get that information with specificity I mean I, part of my frustration Friday night was um, I understand what your answers were that you didn't have the information and, and still don't have a lot of it but that I mean that would drive me crazy if I was in your shoes so I'd assume the priority and the the need that you you feel yourself is to figure out the details of each and every one of these moves. There's a, a lot of us that have some real concerns. And again, in, in this role, as from this body, we have additional responsibility to ask these questions and to find out what happened and to hold people accountable to the extent we can um, in our authority. And so we want to we want to do that. And it's really hard to do that job when we can't get the answers or it's pieced together from a bunch of different either social media posts or other things that um, just cause a lot more concerns. Um, all, all of us are getting information from all sorts of different sources, and the information I want most of all is what comes from you and um, has the most accuracy and legitimacy that's there. And I just don't feel like we're getting that at the timely enough and in a way that we can act have action items on it enough. So please um, continue to get us information on that and help us to answer some of these questions. It's you know, everybody's watching and um, we're, we're going to be held accountable for the what we do now and what we have done. And so um, that's what I want to encourage as much as we possibly can. Um, I am. Chair. <clears throat> Chair. Yeah. Just one quick point to you, what you just stated. I want you to know, too, and all of you, that I am beginning to get information, and I would like to have some, of course, a little more validity to it, but I, for example, in the last couple of days, I've talked to people who are involved in the, in the uh, uh, bridge, and so one person in particular is telling me, ma'am, we had no idea. We, we were told one thing, and then all of a sudden, the orders changed to go across the bridge, and we just started walking and following. That wasn't what I signed up for, but they just walk, walk in because they believed that the truth was told and they had been lied to. So I wanted to be able to get out there and, and I said, get out there, but I'm getting information coming in here. I'm not going out much uh, in those large crowds, but I want to let you know that the I'm just getting some of this information. So I know it's difficult for the police, but you want to make sure that the truth is told because you are dealing with people who will give the, will lie. I'm just going to tell you, some are going to be truthful and some folks out there just lying just to kind of exacerbate the situation. But I believe this individual is telling me the truth. And I know she's a little bit afraid because she didn't want to be threatened or intimidated. But I can, I think I believe her when she says that they were told one thing and all of a sudden they were told, let's go across the bridge. So Thank let's, you. let's work with this chief and, and I'm going to keep working as well as an elected official. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. Uh, it's, and it's, the information is coming from our own police officers as well, trying to figure out what was happening, when was happening, when decisions were made and that kind of thing. So it's trying to get to the bottom of this for everybody. Um, all right, let me just do this. There's a couple of things that I wanna mention specifically um, as far as future actions to take place. Um, one, I, has to, I asked some questions about this Friday and we got part, a part of the answer, but I do believe it's important for us to find a mechanism 
maybe it's through our auditor's office, but for a third party to really review and look at um, proactive interventions and what we're currently doing to ensure that, I mean, I, I believe it's a, a responsibility of all of us to root out whatever um, racism, bias, um, you know, what preferences that we need to through behavior that in some cases our city in the past has overlooked whether it's intentional or unintentional or through passive acceptance, none of this is acceptable. And so we've got to, the one thing I wanna be able to tell our community is we have done everything in our power to root out any and every potential uh, wrongdoer in our police department and in you know, the rest of the city for that matter. And so I wanna, I wanna take that on. Um, I'm, I am, I heard some questions earlier about it. I am frustrated that we don't have I mean, even after asking some questions, we don't have real clear use of force policies. So we do need to look at those. I'm perfectly supportive of getting community engagement in that part of it and trying to determine the best way to keep our community safe and our officers safe um, and review um, our, all of our use of force policies. I want to, as we just spoke about, have an enhanced process around after action reports and looking at that, the best way we can prohibit something negative happening in the future is to look at what has happened and how we dealt with it and correct the mistakes that we've made in the past. Um, similarly, I've heard lots of talk and I think this is an area that I've heard nothing but agreement on all points of this. And I, so it, to me, it rises to one of the highest areas of, of opportunity is additional training and de-escalation and specifically conflict resolution. Um, I've seen proposals that involve community mediation programs. This is an area that I'm passionate about, that I teach in, that I love. And I think there's, there's ways to um, use the skills of conflict resolution to help our, 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 everybody involved in this situation. And I think the more that we can include that in our high schools and our, even our middle schools, I know there are peer mediation programs out there, but to have specific um, de-escalation training you know, all of our kids, a big portion of our kids are dealing with trauma each and every day, and they're often not equipped with the tools to do, do so. So we, we combine that with another area where our law enforcement and community can benefit from the same type of training, same type of policies, and create a whole culture of, of dispute resolution and conflict resolution. Um, I, I do think we need to continue to take a look at our uh, Office of Police Oversight, Citizen Police Review Board, and see how that's working and find areas that it could be improved um, and let it work. Um, so there's, I think there's some opportunities there to continue to focus on that space. Um, I've been advocating for a long time and will continue. You know, right care is one step of this. Other departments have mental health units within their police department. There's a lot of different ways that we could address mental health that I think would help our communities in a number of ways and invest in that way. And to this point, you know, as we start to hear more and more people talk about defunding public safety, um, I, I'm, I'm not in that camp. And I, I believe that so much of what we have done to address some of these issues, you know, still fall under public safety, but it's just because that's where it breaks down in the budget. We're doing um, some steps that are, that are hugely helpful. And I think that's another area as we've created the Office of Integrated Public Safety. I think that we can continue to, to shift some resources in that way and, and to make um, some productive steps with that office as well. You know, we had the, the mayor's task force and other, even the chief's violent crime plan um, that I've been somewhat critical of and remain so as I think that we need more specificity. I don't have a, a level of comfort that, you know, the, the department when we say that, that the, everybody even knows what it means that we're moving in the same direction on some of these things. And so, but we do know we need lights and cameras and lighten up certain areas. And those are things that can make huge differences and huge impacts very quickly um, that increase the public safety. But also, I mean, that's, those are things that are gonna be likely within the public safety budget. And I, I don't want people thinking, you know, getting confused about what we're trying to do with that. It's helping serve the community and keeping people safe. Um, I do believe there's other steps we've started. Some of us have started and we were looking even before COVID hit to try to bring a briefing and do a, a tour of our jail and look at 
um, some of the bail reform options that are out there that I think are hugely important and that we can, um, we can make progress on relatively quickly as long as we're all working together. And I think this is the type of thing that, that gets all of us on the same page to work on these things that we have shared goals in. If we immediately run to the, the fringes and the edges of some of this, I, it makes it harder, I think, to make a lot of progress. And so um, I'm, I'm encouraged by these particular areas of opportunities. I look forward to, to pushing as much as we can in these spaces to make the changes because at the end of the day, um, we do have a problem in Dallas and this is a time for uh, redemption and we can do so through some specific policies and things that, that make a difference. Um, Chief Hall and NTC, I, I, still, I still have lots more questions that I will ask um, in the future and, and follow up on as to what has happened over the last few days. I have some, um, you know, it's, it's hard because I never liked the Monday morning quarterback type deal, but I, I think it's stuff that we have to address so that it doesn't happen moving forward. And um, there are genuine concerns relating to to the impact it's having in our community and in our police department. So I will, I will stop at this point and um, I will, if, if you don't mind, uh, Vice Chairman Ar Woman Arnold, if you would take over the meeting just for a minute, I'll be back as soon as I can, but I have to step away for just a minute. All right, so I, as, as we leave now, are there any other questions from yeah, any other yeah. member? Uh, yep, a member, yes, member. Okay, Blewett, Mendelson and then Blewett, thank you as well as Councilman Thomas. And I'm sorry, and can you share with me how long I have to speak? On this round, I believe we have about three minutes. Um, I'm sorry, Judge, I'm in, we, we actually- in, well, This is our have, opening, this is our opening. I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. Yes. So is that five minutes? That's 17, 17 minutes. 17, 17 minutes. Thank 17, thank you, okay, that's a long time. Thank you. Um, so I've already given a statement on Friday and I don't and feel like anybody time, needs to hear that again. Um, but I do want to yeah, just highlight this. Time. Excuse, me? Excuse me, Thank uh, you. Council Member Mendelson. Uh, we hear something in the backdrop. We're trying to allow the council member to speak. Am I in error? Please correct me if I am. Do we have 17 minutes per council member? Is that the statement that was made earlier? That's correct. Yes, all right. This round, you have 17 minutes. All right, thank you. So would you all please mute your mic so that Member Mendelson can speak. Thank you. Thank you. So really, I've already given a statement. I'm not going to go back over that. Um, but what I do want to say is that every single council member um, I know I have spoken with about the poverty and discrimination in the city way before all of this, um, before all the protests. And I feel like as a council, we are um, very focused on these issues and um, have been um, addressing them. And this is just accelerating it and I'm glad. Um, I do want to commend the chief on um, immediately implementing the, the duty to intervene policy. I think that's already been in place in terms of the honor and ethics that we ask from our police officers, but to have that as part of um, your general orders, I think is important and I'm glad you did that. Also, um, banning on chokeholds, even though this hasn't been taught for a long time, um, I can't even imagine that this wasn't already banned, but so thank you for making sure that was very explicit. I think there's a real value in going back over what's been done, like a recognition for the community to understand these are things that have been put in place. The problem is that many of them are just a toe in the water. They haven't been fully implemented. And that's what my, um, my biggest concern and frustration, frankly, is. So when we talk about Right Care, a program I 100% support and um, it needs to be expanded greatly. I am just rolling off of a board of one of the largest mental health service agencies in town. I'm, I think mental health is um, completely under addressed in our society. And like many things, we have left them to the police to deal with. And they're unpredictable. Um, and they need extra and special training. 
So my question with Right Care for you, Chief, please, is how many Right Care teams do you have? Where can they service? How many calls have they been out on? Let's say in the in 2020 or in the last year, however you want to break it down. And how many calls did we have for mental health service that they could not go on because of the limited resource? Okay, I, I don't have all of the data in front of me for that, but I can tell you we have uh, one right care team in South Central. Uh, there was a presentation made to public safety to expand uh, to two additional teams, one in the north and then a, a central or a roving uh, right care team. And right now uh, that is, if, correct me if I'm wrong, John, we're waiting for funding for that uh, in this fiscal, fiscal year, but that is uh, where we are as it relates to teams. As it relates to the numbers of how many people, how many calls we've answered in 2020, I don't have that in front of me. I can get you that as soon as possible. Chief, Chief, I can tell you that we, we respond to an average of 1,500 mental health calls a month. Um, and that is um, roughly the average that we saw in 2019. I don't have the 2020 data in front of me, um, but I can tell you that that, was, that represents a pretty large number of police resources that absent a right care team. And that's really the reason for the expansion is to try to manage uh, that call load in a way that produces some results to eliminate it at some point, or at least reduce it at some point. So how many calls would a right care team answer in a month, in a, in a regular month? So they, were, they responded to about 184 of those calls. And that was just because now the, 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 six, the 1,500 was citywide. And bear in mind that the pilot project, project um, and that's what we've been into up until this point, is a pilot project that was funded just for South Central Patrol Division. And so they respond to an average of 184 calls per month. And um, that, that is the experience we saw in South Central. So what we're seeing is about 12% of the calls for mental health services are answered by a right care team. And so what I'm saying is we're not necessarily deploying the appropriate resource for the actual need. And when some of my colleagues use terminology um, about reimagining, defunding, blah, blah, we can call whatever we want. I think what you're hearing from council is we want to make sure things like right care are funded so that we do deploy the resource that's appropriate to the call. That said, I want the people who deploy, whether it's right care or any other officer, to also be fully trained, all the way up to the chief. I want to know, we're, we're claiming we've done, we've implemented de-escalation training, but clearly we have not trained the whole force. How, what percentage of the force today has been trained in de-escalation? The, the entire force has been trained in de-escalation. Anyone who came through the academy got de-escalation training in the academy, and they get it every other year. So that's for every officer. But you said you had not. I, uh, I am the chief, and so uh, I'm not required to go through de-escalation training. I've actually reviewed it um, and... Uh, you know, red and everything else, but I'm not required. I think I'm good because I'm actually uh, the one making sure that the training is given. So you're saying every single officer at DPD has gone through de-escalation training within the past two years? Yes, I'm saying if they, if their course, on their core cycle, they get a de-escalation training, time, distance, cover. Yes. Okay. So another item that you had on there is about the 360 simulation. How many officers have gone through, what percentage has gone through that training? And what's the timeline to get everybody trained? So the, the new recruits go through it. There are different units that utilize it and go through it for training. So I would have to get you the numbers on actually who's trained on the, on the, on the, uh, the simulator machine. If you had to make a guess on what percentage of the force has done it, what guess would you make? And I will not hold you to it. I, I, I am not comfortable putting out an estimate. 
uh, because I don't want it to be held against me. I'm not, okay. I'm not just told I'm not going to hold you against it. Okay. Um, implicit bias training. What percentage of the force would you say has completed that training? I would say a small percentage. We rolled it out about a year and a half ago. There's some train the trainers in the classroom sizes are about 25. So maybe 300, 400 officers may maybe have been trained in, 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 in uh, advice. And I mean, that, that may be uh, plus or minus. So what I would say is that um, instead of having a discussion about defunding the police department, training is an area where I hope we will see an increase in the budget. And actually this past year, we decreased training, if I'm not correct. Let's see. Um, the academy training and in-service, $3 million less than last year. So I hope that when y'all are working on the budget, you will consider that. Um, when we're talking about um, the police basketball programs and chess, um, is that all under police community outreach? We spend $1.7 million on that a year. Is that what yes. that falls? Yes, ma'am. And is it right that you're, uh, you're conducting 3,000 community meetings a year? Is that right? Yes, if not more. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's remarkable, and I commend you for that. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to um, this 21st century policing. It was released so many years ago. Um, I saw on your short-term plan that um, there is an item, I'm sorry, is it short-term? It may have been longer term to go through, but I just want to make sure I'm correct in understanding what this says. Are you saying that to date, nobody has already looked through what are the policies and procedures at DPD versus the recommendation of this presidential task force that hasn't happened yet? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we have done that. And that's why when you look at the eight for eight, that, that uh, seven of the eight, we are in compliance with. We've done that. Now we're going back through in line with community stakeholders, a lot of ask from community and making sure that our policies are in line with what uh, is also being asked for. We've gone through the initial review. Now we're reviewing with community uh, asks in mind, in line with uh, 21st century policing. So I guess my question is this, is if it has been gone through, how come we hadn't already done something about chokeholds and, and the duty to intervene policy? At the point so, that that review was done, and, and you came up with seven of the eight tenants being being implemented, why weren't those two done? Because in our policies, we have uh, we we are able to. If the statement was a fail, if you have a failure to act or failure to take proper action, so those things for us were in line with that. So understanding that the community is asking for a duty, a specific duty to intervene, it's, it was clear for us in law enforcement, and oftentimes that's our language, but the community is requ requesting, and we say, for it to be absolutely clear in black and white, then we've implemented a duty to intervene. But for us, it, it existed in other areas. So you feel like most of the people on the force already felt that they had that duty? Is that true? Yes, I do. Okay, and then same thing for the chokehold. If we haven't been teaching it since 2004, um, frankly, with as many retirements as we've had, do you feel like, is this something that has been used or has not been used? It has not been used, but we want it to be absolutely clear okay. that it's documented. Okay, well, I appreciate that clarity, and I'm, and I'm glad to know that. I'm thrilled to know that, really. Um, the other things that I wanted to talk about are the things that I think are um, policy issues that need to be looked at and addressed. Um, one is the demographics interactions monthly. So that report that you're saying you have annually, um, we need to be looking every month at how are the interactions with the police um, being looked at in terms of demographics? Are we um, are we over arresting women? Are we under arresting, you know, like, like, what is it so that we can understand what's happening and maybe why and address it, whether that's addressing it 
police oriented or other ways. The de-escalation training obviously to continue and to really understand um, the level of training. You know, you're saying it's four hours once every two years. Does it need to be more? Does it need, is that the right training? Does it need to be uh, more in depth? Um, the strategy for um, how we're addressing mental health and addiction services, we need to have a very serious conversation with the county. These are not the roles of the police department. And the county, which by the way, has funding, dedicated funding, um, that is supposed to be addressing these areas, um, has not. And so while they may be a partner with us on the very limited uh, programs we have with Right Care, we're gonna need to have a completely different focus with the county who's made a lot of calls about what we should be doing with public safety to actually partner with us to provide the mental health and addiction services that are needed so that they're not a police interaction. Would you agree on that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's good. Um, legislatively, I think we also need to look at what we're doing. Um, you have been reporting, and in fact, it's, um, I believe in, in, the, in, the, in the briefing materials, um, about how many days people that you arrest for violent crimes are in jail. And they are shockingly low. And I think we're gonna need to, again, have a conversation with the county about our efforts to keep our people safe by removing people who can't maintain uh, civility and um, letting them out in less than 10 days, um, which I think was the largest number of any of that group is just unacceptable. So expanding right care, um, how we do background checks on our new uh, recruits, I think is very important and um, needs to make need to make sure it's very robust. I think there needs to be Just want to give a two minute warning, two minute warning. Thank you about um, body cam cameras and when they're turned on and off. And um, want to go back to internal affairs process. I think the investigations are happening in a timely manner, but it's very clear those investigations stall out when they get to the command staff and they sit on the desk for a year or longer. And I think that's actually meant to punish the officer so that they're in limbo, but we have to be able to clear those and make sure that officers who have done things that are inappropriate are actually reprimanded or removed as appropriate. And the ones that haven't, and someone's just mad at them, we get those cleared also. So um, those are things that I think are my top policy items. And um, I think I've made it in my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Menderson, and thank you, Vice Chairman Arnold. Who's uh, committee members wishing to speak? Blewett was on deck. I'm not sure if I was first or second. Uh, Go ahead, Councilmember Blewett. Thank you, Chair. Chief Hall, um, Ms. Mendelson touched on something that I was going to bring up, and I'm going to go a little deeper into it, and that's the idea of de-escalation. And initially, you've talked about it before. You've talked about it again today. Initially, I supported you and your position as a chief, but I've had the opportunity, and I consider it a good opportunity, to see you firsthand how you interact with the public. And while you are a chief, I do see you rolling up your sleeves and, and getting pretty close and personal with, with our citizens. And I would like to ask that you yourself go through some, some more training on this as well, simply by nature of how you approach this role is that something that you'd consider doing for us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Because like I said, I, I've seen you up close and personal and you're, you're, a, you're very approachable and on the street kind of person. And so I think that'd be good. Um, and so you also touched on the after action report. Mr. McGee talked about that. I brought it up on Friday. I brought it up again um, in other times that I'm in an awkward position because I have a lot of constituents who asked me questions about what's been going on over the last week or so. And I've been pretty candid talking about the evolution of the protesters 
You know, and granted, there are a number of protesters that have been peaceful the whole time, but there have been a handful that were not back on Friday and Saturday. And then it seems like all of the protesters have, have um, gotten the message that their message is much clearer um, when they peacefully protest. And I've been very um, quiet uh, specifically on police action because I've been waiting for the police to tell me how they've evolved. I see that you told Mr. McGill two weeks to 30 days is a typical response on an after action report. This does put me in an awkward position because I either have to not respond to my constituents with what the police action is today versus what it was, or I have to speculate. And I don't like that. It, I need to have better information to be able to tell my constituents how police uh, responses have, have changed over the last week or 10 days. Can we speed this up? So, so what, we're, what we've uh, agreed to do is look at each day and try and give you a synopsis of that um, as much as we can uh, without being held to uh, an absolute, only because we're constantly getting information in on a, a day after day about something that happened two or three days ago. So we're going to grab some uh, statistics, events, and break them down each day so we can show the evolution of what happened from one day to the next. Um, but understanding that if other information comes in, it may change uh, what you read on that day. Yeah, Chief, I think that's, that's great. That's I'm about, not trying. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. That's only about uh, what actually happened versus versus what we have in, in, in that moment. Yeah, that would be helpful to me. I'm not looking for a comprehensive, exact. I, I'm, I have a narrative in my mind of how this has evolved. I would just like to have more help from you so that I can be more clear with my constituents when I tell them this is what the police are doing today and this is why. So yeah, not, not completely uh, forensically done, but just broad-based broad um, and um, details that I can push forward. So I like that, that's good. Uh, a lot of my colleagues have brought up other policy issues and concern. I, I consider this an ongoing conversation. It's really hard for me to get ahead of the conversation on specific policies because I'm going to want to hear a lot more. Um, so I'm not going to eat up all of my 17 minutes talking about you know, my 10 point plan. I, um, I really want to hear ideas from you why um, changes are in effect, why they're needed, why they're not needed. So I'll be responsive to that. But my main three points, one, you've already addressed on de-escalation uh, for you, two, on the after action report, and then earlier on a different briefing, I talked about transparency. Um, I really think we, beyond the after action report is, I really am a believer in transparently telling the public um, every point of contact between our officers and our residents, just so that misinformation doesn't get the chance to um, um, become perceived fact. I think we're seeing that on the bridge. We're seeing a lot of misinformation. We need to be doing a better job on that. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, unless Chief wants to answer anything that I just touched on, are you good? Yes, sir. I, I do want to okay. just, just, I do just want to, to just put on the record that uh, I appreciate you noticing that there was an evolution, and that was that our tactics started out what they are and have been for many, many years, very peaceful. And as the crowd evolved and the, the, the dynamics changed, our tactics changed. And so not right now, our tactics are back to where they were uh, the entire time where we handle protests in this city every single day. And so we do need to make sure that that's documented and that you have that. And so we'll work to get that out as soon as possible. You know, Chief, I appreciate that. Like I said, I, hey, look, even I, as, as a politician, you know, I was at a distance on Saturday night. I got closer to it on Tuesday. I've been to protests now. I've met protesters and I've seen it with my own eyes how, how they, uh, um, how they've changed, and I'm sure you've seen it too. So I just think it's a good story to get out there of what we're doing to tell them that we've noticed what their protests really are and that it is no longer a threat to us and you know, we're all working for the same thing. We want Dallas to be a better city and, and that story needs to get out there. So um, thank you for all of that. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I guess I'll say I yield back my time. Thank you, Councilmember Blewett. Um, is Chairman Thomas, are you up? 
I am, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. A um, couple of things I wanted to uh, emphasize, and I know colleagues, uh, especially those of you, and we call you newbies, uh, were not on the council when we approved the uh, Office of Community uh, Police Oversight Board and the Office of Police Oversight. That is a uh, tool that is available uh, to show and to build trust with the community. Uh, some of you may have received the email. I hosted a, a um, webinar, um, virtual panel discussion uh, about the Office of Police Oversight with our monitor, Tanya, our chair, uh, Jason Robo, uh, the chair of the coalition, um, Chonga Higgins, and uh, a very outspoken ad, uh, activist um, for a long time, Olika Green. Um, that was because many people are not aware that we don't have a review board anymore. We have an actual community police oversight board. And I wanted to make sure that that is known and understood. I, I suggested to the chair, and I know we're at the, you know, we're dealing with tough times right now. For, that we have a full briefing for this committee uh, on the Office of Police Oversight by a monitor so she can share with us how this board, I mean, how, I'm sorry, how the office is set up and the chair of the oversight board can talk about the role of the board and how the board can help reestablish their trust uh, with the community. Um, do we have a city attorney online? Queso. I believe uh, Casey Burgess or Jennifer yeah. Huggard. Are... I'm, I'm, I'm here, uh, Council Member. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, because I need to ask you this question. Uh, there was some discussion, there is discussion amongst those who are, you know, um, uh, leading protests about the Office of Police Oversight and it functioning independently. Is there any state law, anything that would pre prevent the council for voting on a resolution, uh, or um, not a resolution, I'm sorry, an uh, ordinance that would allow the Office of Police Oversight to function independently? Um, we would have to look at that, but I, and, and I'm not sure what you mean in terms of function independently. Could you, could you give me a little bit more detail on that? When I say function independently, they would be able to uh, uh, have some autonomy and more autonomy than they have according to the current ordinance. Well, we can certainly look at proposed changes and make changes to um, the ordinance if the council desires. And so we would have to look and see what types of things you want to change. Um, and then we can, you know, we can certainly explore that, but you could, you could make changes to, uh, to give them additional authority. So we would just have to okay. look at what that is. And is there anything that prevents the monitor? Because that was some discussion. Um, and what will the monitor uh, from from reporting, as opposed to to city staff reporting to the office of police, community police oversight board? I'm sorry. Um, you said reporting what? To the board, as opposed to work reporting to the city manager, or being within the office of the city manager. Um, we would have to look at that. We would have to look into that and see uh, the way it was set up is that they're reporting to the city manager, but we can certainly explore um, that person, the, the oversight person reporting to the board. Directly. Okay. One of the reasons I'm asking these questions is because um, this is some of the concerns that have been brought to the table by some of the protests. Also, at the time of negotiating, you know, we were negotiating, we agreed that we would come back to the table and we will look at amending the ordinance or making whatever changes were necessary. So I want to ask you those questions. If you can begin looking into that, if you can update me on that, I would appreciate it. I certainly will. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair.
Do we have a bad connection? Committee members, are you able to hear me at this time? I can hear oh, yeah. you. All right, so were there any other uh, committee members that need to make a, a statement? All right, uh, any non-committee members wishing to make a statement? All right, if not, the, uh, I think Chair has uh, looked at them, uh, probably spoken on it. We have a briefing by yeah. memorandum. Uh, do we I have- Ms. Yes. yes. Ms. Gates, I had a, a couple questions. All right, thank you. I just couldn't, I couldn't see you. Yeah, thank you. thanks. Can you see me now? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm a not, but this is not you. opportunity for non-committee me, uh, members, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, right. Um, thank you. I mean, um, and I've been, I've been in it. I, I've been listening as much as I could, but I had to take a, a few phone calls. So hopefully I'm not going to be repeating anything, but um, I want to thank the city manager for um, these initiatives. But I do have some questions related to the right care program. Um, and I'm supportive of trying to expand it. But could, do you have, and I guess this would be for Mr. Fortune or um, Chief Hall, um, what, what portion, um, I mean, have you worked on, if you're expanding, what you think that's going to cost? Liam, we have, and uh, I'm going back now to the presentation that we made to the city, uh, to the Public Safety Committee previously. It was additionally, it's approximately 2.27 million in new costs projected at the time. Um, and we do think there are some opportunities for some grant funds to be able to fund a portion of this. Um, one of the things that we've been working on and, and Kevin Oden, who you all know is working with Office of Homeless Solutions was the lead staff member in helping develop the expansion plan and working to help expand it. Obviously Kevin has been uh, pretty uh, uh, involved with uh, his new roles and new duties here recently. However, he, he did create a very nice, robust plan for us that I think gives us a good starting point. Um, the steps forward will be to see what opportunities we can uh, uh, utilize from existing grant resources. And then, as, of course, as we go through the budgeting um, cycle to be able to determine if there's any additional needs, we would have to recommend those to the city council at that time. Okay, so obviously you're going to be bringing that forward in the upcoming budget. And, Correct. And, and potentially some out of resources. That would be, that would be great. Um, well, one I would like to advocate for uh, that we um, continue it to address domestic violence as we've seen that that has um, gone up. I don't want that to get ignored in, in these discussions. Um, there might be, uh, you know, we've embedded in the past the social worker um, to help with um, with the calls. I mean, it, there we know they can escalate and they can be very dangerous um, for both the for both police as well as the victim and and the. Uh, so I want to make sure, but I mean, if there's different ways to help, and, and I and Mark has going to look at it as well. If there's different options to be able to uh, address those calls with more resources um, like social workers I'd be you know supportive of that um, you know we have a lot of uh, victims that are sometimes afraid to call because they're afraid you know police will um, come they could be arrested or the, the offender could be arrested who's the sole the provider so it, you know this is an area I think when you talk about reimagining um, but there's also an element of danger and obviously, you know, police have to be um, involved in those calls, but I just don't want that to get lost in the discussion when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, divesting public safety, it, it needs to make sure that, um, you know, what I'm hearing is there's different ways we can, like, we can respond. And I'm a supporter of that. My concern is going to be financial um, because, you know, we know we're going through a very difficult budget. And, but if we have ways we can incorporate addressing mental illness um, and, uh, you know, inequities um, in our city to be able to be a safer city, 
um, you know, there, I would be supportive of them, but we got to figure out how we're going to be able to address them in the budget. So thank you for looking for alternative ways of funding. And then I would also add, um, and, I, and I think we're going to get more reports. I'm not going to, I think some of the, my colleagues have asked these questions related to the protest um, and arrest. I mean, I think we have made some arrests related to violent um, violence or people with felony back backgrounds. And so I'd like to have a better understanding of that. Um, I think there's been some talk about not having surveillance and I would be curious on how you, uh, I'd be really concerned that if we're not looking uh, in these groups for people that actually um, could cause um, danger to the, and be a threat to the other protesters that that would be going down a way that we would, that these, what have been in the last few days, very diverse, peaceful protests. Um, if we can't c keep them safe, um, I think we're gonna have um, a, lot of, a lot of problems. So understanding those that have tried to take advantage of the situation um, and that you have made arrests with is something I would like to have a better understanding. Um, and I think those are all my comments right now. Um, I've just been listening and um, appreciate um, thinking out of the box and um, working on how we can be a safer city for all. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, committee or non-committee, questions on the briefing items? Memo item. Um, Mendelson, I'm sorry, are we yes. talking about the, the memos? Yes. Yes. Um, so my first questions are about the radios. Is there yes, someone who can answer? Okay, yes, great. Yes, we have, a, we have staff. I, I probably won't be able to answer them, but we, I can direct this to the right staff in, depending on the question. Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to say as somebody who seems to always be saying Dallas first, I want to say this is the first um, regional effort that I think actually treats Dallas fairly. So thank you for thinking in this creative way to save money and utilize assets so well with this proposal. Um, will the GMRS um, consortium, is that something we would be added to or we are just leasing the space with them? Um, Will Sneed, who's with our um, technology services department, is leading that project. I believe it's actually um, something we're helped, uh, we're, we're communicating with an existing entity that already exists or trying to schedule. But Will, can you address that, please? Uh, yes, sir, I can. Um, this is Will Sneed, Assistant Director for Infrastructure. Uh, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, John is uh, right. They're an existing entity. Um, they cover the cities of Garland, Mesquite, Rowlett, and Saxe. They have their own radio towers. Um, we're going to utilize their radio towers in conjunction. We're going to, uh, to connect with them, or they, we'll allow them to connect with our radio system so that they have better coverage so that if, for example, they have tornadoes or anything like that, and they have uh, fire entities or police entities coming back in from another area, they'll be able to interoperate a lot easier. Great, so we're not joining the consortium, we're just using their equipment, is that correct? That is correct. Great, and then on the map you have, um, in District 12, you have the word Highland, is that Highland Springs? Is that where you're gonna put that tower? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm just looking, yep, yes, ma'am. Okay, well, I mean, I just think that's a great job, thank you. You're welcome, ma'am, thank you. I do have questions about the other, the other briefings. Um, do you want to, you want me to continue, or you want me to wait and see if there's any other radio ones? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So, sorry, let me pull up the next one. So the next one is on the dashboard. Um, I do want to say thank you for putting the clearance rates on there. I don't think I got those for 2019. Um, and so if I did, I apologize, it's lost, it's lost in my inbox, but um, 
I know I asked for them last month. Do you know if those were sent to me? Yes, yes ma'am. We sent them, but we will resend them. Okay, well, I appreciate it. We've all gotten about, you know, 5,000 emails in the past 24 hours. Um, so, um, when we're talking about the performance metrics and the clearance rates for aggregated assault, it looks like there's sort of a 50-50 chance that it might get cleared um, and robberies probably not getting cleared. Um, and I'm just wondering that, you know, when we look at the, the graph, it looks like in two years, we've never, we've never even hit the national average. And I'm wondering um, why you think that is. So one of the one of the things that we know is that we've been low in the investigator uh, capacity. That our numbers are lower. Uh, we've seen an increase over the past categories, uh, but due to manpower shortages, our ability to ensure that we had an adequate number of uh, investigators has challenged us. I agree. Um, and in fact, it looks like you added maybe 20 officers to that. Um, um, although we've added quite a few officers to the force. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, I was alluding to this earlier, the, the chart that talks about how long somebody who has been apprehended stays in jail. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. What's your question regarding that, ma'am? Well, so 31% of the people are staying one to 10 days in jail. 5% um, of the people are there for 11 to 20. 2%, 21 to 31 day, 30 days, less than 1%, more than 30 days. And then there's 47% that are still in jail, um, I guess, as of the report. So. If we, if we actually apprehend them, it looks like they're getting out very, very quickly. And I'm wondering if you could help explain why. So, um, of course, Councilwoman, you know that our job is to lock them up, to make sure we identify those violent offenders and put them away. Um, I, that's, a, that's a question that you're gonna have to ask the, the judge, the judicial system and not us. We are doing our job every day, and I just want to continue to commend the men and women of the Dallas Police Department. They've been doing an excellent job through COVID, through protests, through everything, and making sure that we're arresting them. So um, it's just someone else's responsibility to make sure that they stay there. So I guess it, what I'm saying is that if a third of the people are there for less than 10 days, we're, we're spending a lot of money to go arrest them. We're spending a lot of time on that. And I would like to look at what are those cases that we're wasting our time on? We're putting officers in harm's way to, to do this work. Um, if they're just going to get right back out, I'm just trying to understand what the point is. So the point is we have to keep our community safe. These are violent offenders. These are not, you know, traffic violations. These are, these are violent offenders who are committing robbery, aggravated assaults, some homicide. So it's not a waste of time for us. It's what we have to do in order to keep the community safe. So if they are violent and we're doing this to keep them safe and then they're out in one to 10 days, have we done that? The Dallas Police Department has done our part. Okay. I agree with you. Um, <laughs> what are your suggestions on how we can change that? I think that's a, a, a conversation again, uh, Councilwoman, for the individuals who are responsible for the justice system. And that's a conversation that, that has to be had on that side of the house. Okay. So um, the other numbers about the 31% increase in aggravated assault, I'm very concerned about that. Um, that's on top of the 27% increase we had in 2019 citywide, the even 7% for business burglary, that's on top of the 19% increase we had in 2019 citywide. And are, are you- so, so, so it's not on top of, it's, 
not in 31% on top of the 27%. Well, sure it is. It's 31% in 2020. And in 2019, we had a 27% increase. So it's 31% increase over the 2019 numbers. Those are the years you're comparing. So if it's are you using a different year for a baseline? No. Well, that's on top of then. Okay. Um, thank you. That those are my questions about that. Um, for the Starlight program, you've got um, the outcomes on the three locations that um, you've been presenting. Um, and I'm glad to see that you've got three new locations. That's great. Um, and I'm wondering, there's no data on those. Are they not up and running yet or, or what's happening with that? I'm sorry, Councilwoman, you cut out. What, what'd you say? For the Starlight program, um, congratulations. I'm glad to see that you've added three new locations, but the data in this report is only on the three locations that were already existing. And I'm just wondering if they have launched or what the launch date is, or when we would see data that would include all six locations then. So we have six additional locations aside from the three. So those six locations are the ones that we're getting ready to launch. And so the three that you're seeing are still in the pilot process. Does that make sense? No. The, the data that we have on the three is the same three that we've been seeing. You've got new locations coming on. When do you expect to be able to have data on those? Oh, I'm sorry. When, when are we launching the data on the new ones? Uh, we're looking to launch that by the end of August. Um, and then, the numbers you have for narcotics, um, does that include marijuana and what percent of those offenses are marijuana compared to other drugs? So I don't have the breakdown. I have the team to turn up. So we don't have the breakdown between the drugs, but narcotics, is, they're, they're inclusive of all drugs. We can get a little different. It's breakdown between narcotics, uh, uh, cocaine and all of the other methamphetamines and all of those. We can have those broken down. Broken down. Without using statistics, would you be able to characterize what percent or how big the portion of the narcotics um, offenses include marijuana? So we clearly see we we clearly see the mark the the, the larger uh, amounts of our narcotics arrest and enforcement around marijuana. That percentage I don't have, but clearly marijuana is the largest. Okay. Um, and then let's see, for COVID, um, ah, so for, for doors, you rolled out a program um, in, in one of the Southern Dallas stations to do mandated reporting for um, essentially priority for calls. And I'm wondering, because we do have a global pandemic going on, if you have considered, because it's in your right to do, expanding that to all stations so that we are not putting our officers at risk for things that aren't crimes we can solve anyhow. We have ex extended doors. It is a citywide, um, much, much of a mandate right now. We've done that since March. So it's an offering or it's required like you're just not going to come out for certain things it's it's required every when we when unless it's abs, an absolute necessity where um we can't get the information they can't uh do the online report and we cannot take it over the phone and that's very rare uh, but if they cannot do the report over online we have an expediter that takes that call over the phone and that's what that's where we're pushing uh the majority of our calls to right now. And can I say that there are not some that we respond to? Um, it just depends on who's who's calling, what their uh, issues are, and whether they're able to get us, us the information that they need. But for the most part, I would say we're well over 80% of our calls that are going. Excellent. Thank you. 
Um, I do have one for um, the courts. We didn't forget you this time. I think it's three for sample. Um, and my questions for the courts on the dashboard is um, why um, we've had such a sharp increase in dismissals and also why the final disposition of the citations, um, why that count is so much higher. This is that's, if, if, that's, if that's the same answer about the records and, and just cleaning them out that are old, that's fine. Um, but I'm just trying to make sure that's what it is. That is correct. correct. It is the administrative review process. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Those are all my questions from the briefings. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from any on the committee or off the committee on the memos? Hearing none. It is. 332 and at this time we will adjourn the public safety committee meeting.